Please welcome to the IIS Educational Fund meeting at the SATIC Congress, Science and Community in the Response to HIV and Co-Infection in Latin America. The aim of this meeting is to reduce the gap between the latest scientific advance on HIV and their implementation. This session will focus on HIV and STD and the large burden of prevalent infection, including among key population. It will also present new paradigm after you and you and PrEP, the use of art for treatment and prevention of HIV and a discussion of how to contain the STI epidemic. I am Monica Thurman from the Dominican Republic, member of EIS Governing Council for Latin America and Caribbean. And it is a pleasure for me to be your facilitator in this section on HIV and STD. We are going to have two interesting topics, HIV and STD in Stranger Bedfellows by Professor Kenneth Myers and STD, STI in the era of PrEP with Professor Jean-Michel Molina. So please let me introduce you our first speaker, Professor Kenneth Myers. Dr. Myers is a medical research director and co-chair for the Fenwin Institute. He is also professor of medicine at Harvard Medical School, professor of the Department of Global Health and Population at Harvard School of Public Health and director of HIV presentation research and attending physician at Beth Israel Legi Health. Dr. Mayer is going to talk about HIV and STD strange bed fellows. Please, Dr. Mayer. Hola, hello everyone. I'm Kenneth Mayer uh, from Boston, from Fenway Health and Harvard Medical School. And I wanna talk about HIV and STI, why they're estranged bedfellows. So we have to keep in mind that there are more than a million treatable SDIs acquired every day. Uh, this just gives you uh, the, the numbers of gonorrhea, chlamydia, syphilis, and trichomoniasis around the world. And the reason we care about the SDIs is that they, there's a huge burden. Um, there's over half a billion people with uh, genital tract uh, herpes infection and HPV, which can cause cancer in women. One in seven women have oncogenic uh, uh, HPV strains. Also, uh, if we think about the burden of disease, we have to think about SCI prevention as uh, cancer prevention. Uh, it can severely affect uh, pregnancy outcomes and infertility. And for our focus, it plays a role in increasing HIV risk of acquisition and transmission. And certainly the symptoms um, and the um, uh, challenges to intimacy are affecting quality of life. So we talk about epidemiologic synergy. Uh, this term was first uh, coined almost 30 years ago, um, talking about um, AIDS and it affecting poor populations. Judy Wasserheit uh, wrote a paper showing how HIV and SDIs interact with each other. Um, and you can see on the right uh, that um, data from New York and San Francisco suggested that the risk of acquiring HIV after having an SDI is extremely high. Uh, so what is the synergy? Well, there's biology because the SDIs can cause inflammation or ulceration that increases HIV susceptibility or infectiousness. There are the behaviors that, um, the same things that lead to acquiring HIV are the same behaviors associated with SDIs and vice versa. And then there's the epidemiology. People who have SDIs tend to be uh, in, um, concentrated in pools of individuals who may be at high risk for transmission, so-called core groups. and the HIV itself can cause immunosuppression that increases susceptibility and the expression of more severe SCIs. But we're in a new era now. So PrEP and undetectable equals untransmissible means that if somebody is effectively on antiretroviral therapy, uh, their risk of transmission is zero if they're virally suppressed, if they're infected. And if they're on PrEP and they're adherent to PrEP, their risk of acquisition is exceedingly low as well. So we have unlinked synergy now where people can engage in um, condomless sex and be at high risk for SDIs, but not necessarily HIV. And this has a global impact. Just very quickly, you can see here uh, data from Thailand, for people with HIV and at risk for HIV, high SDI burden. This is not unique to one part of the world. 
These are data uh, from South Africa and Nigeria among men who have sex with men. Extremely high prevalence, gonorrhea, chlamydia, and syphilis. And another snapshot, young African women, very high prevalence of SDI. So the populations that we are concerned about at this Congress, people at risk for HIV and people with HIV, are people where SDIs are something that we have to think about as a way of life. There are multiple reasons for this. There's the biology that I mentioned. There's another factor uh, for men who have sex with men and transgender women called role versatility. In other words, um, because anal sex is the most efficient way of HIV transmission, uh, somebody can be the bottom, um, can um, acquire HIV very efficiently, but then if they engage in assertive behavior, they can be an efficient transmitter. So there's something unique about the biology that increases the risk uh, for men who have sex with men and transgender women. But there are other factors that are common across groups. Uh, people at risk for HIV and SEIs oftentimes may uh, feel societal stigma. This may lead to depression, may lead to sub substance use, may lead to uh, behaviors that avoid health seeking. Uh, people may be part of networks where even if they are not having m multiple partners, their partners may be at high risk of having infection. So their risk for acquiring infection is high. There's certain venues. Certainly we now know that there are apps that can um, be associated with HIV uh, and SDI transmission. And certainly in, before the COVID era, there are things like bathhouses that uh, facilitated transmission. And certainly there are many social and structural factors that potentiate HIV and SDI risk. So how can we decrease um, SDI and HIV risk? And you'll hear um, somewhat more uh, from Dr. Molina about some of the biomedical interventions, but I just wanna to touch on a few issues that we can think of as clinicians. Certainly we can screen people more frequently and PrEP is an opportunity to do that. We can do a better job of providing partner services. There are tailored ways that we can um, um, do a better job. So there are clinics like the Dean Street Clinic in London. And those are, these are two screenshots on the side where you can see this, this is something where people can come in. They can input their data on a touch, oops, they can input their data on a touch screen uh, computer and they can um, then get text messages when their test results are back. Um, we can also do a better job of integrating SDI services. We need to do more cross training uh, for providers, uh, certainly. Uh, and we have to address the social and structural impediments. And then there are improved diagnostics that are coming down the pike. So in terms of integration of services, one of the more innovative places in the world has been New York City. They talk about an HIV status neutral approach. So somebody comes into the clinic, if their serous status is unknown or they've had an HIV test but have been sexually active recently, the first thing is to test. If they test negative, then assess them for PrEP and get them uh, to engage in PrEP the same day PrEP starts. If they test positive, similarly to get people uh, to know their status and to get them on treatment. So the reframing is sexual health clinics as opposed to disease focused clinics. Instead of SDI or SED clinics, it's a sexual health clinic is, is the new, new mantra. Um, the other issue is the workforce. A colleague of mine, Doug Krakauer, calls it the purview paradox, which is that infectious disease specialists have said, uh, primary providers should pr prescribe because uh, these are not people living with HIV. Um, and uh, primary care providers say, you know, PrEP is for specialists. We really have to cross train so that everybody sees themselves as a practitioner around sexual health, because this is a very common uh, set of issues for humans. And however people present to the system, we have to be prepared to offer um, a comprehensive package of services. Part of this relates to cultural competence training. And that is that many times people who are at risk for SDI are socially marginalized. And sometimes we as providers are the biggest problem, but there are ways to um, provide more welcoming care, uh, to ask somebody, uh, um, what are the gender of your sex partners, for example, as opposed to saying, do you have, uh, um, are you married? Do you have sex uh, with somebody of the opposite sex and making a heterosexual presumption? Uh, there are a variety of training tools and I've listed a website. Uh, our center has funding from the US federal government. So lgbtqiahealtheducation.org or if you just go to the website of Fenway Health, we have a lot of materials that can be downloaded that can provide um, cultural competence training. Another revolution is the whole idea of bringing the services to people at their homes. So there are a variety of um, uh, private uh, for-profit companies now in the US where people can order SCI testing, get a, get a test kit at home, um, fill it out, send it back and get the, get the information. Uh, these uh, home services can also be means of getting contraception means of getting uh, PrEP as well. We're in the process now of studying routine HIV self-monitoring for PrEP care. 
Uh, so we have a study called PrEP at Home. We did a pilot which uh, found that it was highly acceptable. And now we're studying this in four US cities and we work with a group called Molecular uh, Laboratories. We have a video um, that um, uh, shows participants how they can self swab for the SCIs uh, and how they can prick their finger. We can then screen for um, um, creatinine as, as well as for HIV and syphilis and give the people their results back. And we're evaluating what th whether this is as effective as coming into seeing a clinician. And in the COVID era, this may be a very useful adjunct for clinical services. And then one of the last points I'd like to make is that there are newer diagnostics. This is just one I'd like to call your attention to, but this has been approved by the US FDA. It's a 30 minute genetic test. It can be done in a, a clinician's office. There are a variety of other point of care tests. So if we can turn around the test more quickly, we can tailor treatment for the SDIs uh, more effectively. So in conclusion, the advent of U equals U and PrEP have unlinked HIV and SDI transmission when users are adherent to either of the antiretroviral regimens. But SCI rates remain extremely high among people with HIV and PrEP users. Um, HIV and PrEP care can be a major opportunity to test for and to treat SDIs, and that could limit their spread. And we need new models of HIV, PrEP, and SDI care where we provide one-stop shopping uh, for people who are sexually active. Uh, we really need to retrain the workforce, use newer diagnostic technologies, including internet-based technologies. And if we scale up these approaches, we may be able to do a better job in SDI control, as well as in maintaining people on PrEP and ART. So I wanna thank my uh, colleagues who've contributed slides, and here's a website for our clinic. If anything I mentioned referring to our clinic might be of interest, and thank you for your attention. Thank you, Professor Meyer. We will continue with the next presentation before we begin the question and answer section. So our next speaker to be is Professor Jean-Michel Molina. Dr. Molina is a professor of infectious disease at the University of, of Paris, Diderot, in France, and head of the infectious disease department at the San Luis Hospital in Paris. Dr. Molina is going to talk about STIs and the era of PrEP. Please, Professor Molina. Hola, my name is Jean-Michel Molina from the University of Paris. And it's a pleasure to be part of this uh, educational fund from IES in South America. I have been asked to address the issue of STIs in the era of PrEP, and this is indeed a very controversial issue. These are my disclosures. And let's start uh, directly with this meta-analysis of STI diagnosis among people studying PrEP, and in that case, these individuals were MSM, men who have sex with men. And this uh, analysis looked at uh, a number of uh, open label study and randomized trials, looking at the rate of STI before starting PrEP and during PrEP. And the bottom line here is that overall, in people on PrEP, there is an increase in uh, the rate of STIs by, as you can see here, 24%. And this increase is actually significant for rectal STIs, for rectal chlamydia, and it seems to be greater in recent studies as compared to older studies. But at the same time, we have to acknowledge that among MSM in Europe, and in particular in England, but this is true all over the world, we have seen over the last uh, 15 years, and uh, even more in the last five years, an increase in the rate of uh, a number of bacterial STIs, syphilis in red, gonorrhea in green, and chlamydia in purple. And this increases actually predated the uh, implementation of PrEP in the UK by many years, since PrEP was introduced in the UK in 2015. And you can see that this increase in STI rates uh, was actually quite obvious uh, as early as uh, 2010. So uh, this increase in STI that we see among MSM is probably due to uh, a reduced use of condoms among MSM. Uh, at the time, we have better treatment for HIV, and we know that uh, the treatment associated with undetectable viral load is a, a guarantee that there is no risk of transmission to uh, the different partners. And therefore, uh, the use of condoms has decreased over the last couple of years. 
So there is no surprise that there is an increase in STIs. But to really know whether it is a PrEP that is the cause of STI increase, uh, it's important to look at the study uh, where uh, uh, PrEP was given uh, to MSM. This is uh, data from the PROUD study, where MSM in England were randomized to receive immediate PrEP in blue or deferred PrEP after one year in orange. And what you can see on this slide is after a year of follow-up, pretty high rate of STI in both groups, and the rates were not significantly different, whether you look at all or STIs or only gonorrhea, chlamydia, or syphilis. And in addition, because uh, the testing rate was actually higher in uh, people with immediate PrEP, you know, that would uh, balance the results. And if you look at the overall incidence of STI with immediate PrEP, you can see it's 62 per 100 person years, and it's 55.8 in the deferred arm. And the confidence interval actually overlap. So this uh, study gives you uh, an example that um, it's not PrEP by itself, which is the cause of STI increase. It's because people using PrEP are at high risk of HIV and other STIs. And because they are tested more frequently, you will diagnose a lot of STIs in these individuals. Let's look at a, a more recent uh, study from Australia, the PrEP-X study, where actually the authors were able to look at STI incidence in uh, these individuals within a year before starting the cohort study and uh, within a year during uh, uh, the cohort. Um, and uh, what you could see here on the first row is that the incidence before uh, entering uh, the PrEP study was uh, 69 per 100 person years, and it increased to 98 during uh, the PrEP study, which uh, uh, gives you an adjusted incidence rate ratio adjusted for testing frequency of 1.12. So if you do a comparison before and after, you have a 12% increase in the rate of STIs. But if you look now at uh, those individuals who were already PrEP experienced when they uh, started the core study, you see that the adjusted incidence rate ratio was actually 1.05 and not significantly higher than one. So in these PrEP experienced patients overall and over time with PrEP, there was no increase in STI rates. The increase was seen, however, in the PrEP naive population, those who started PrEP at the time they entered the prep study in Australia, and you can see that these STI incidents increase from 55 to 94%, but we, you adjust for testing frequency, the increase is only 21%. And it's really difficult to know whether this is, I would say the increase we see in the uh, general population among MSM in Australia, or whether it, it is an increase due to the use of PrEP. And uh, we don't know the answer for sure. What we know, however, when you look at the distribution of participants uh, and STI diagnosis is that uh, some participants here, nearly 50%, will not present with STI uh, during their uh, participation to this PrEP study. And actually it's only a low proportion, 25% of the participants in this PrEP study which who accounted for 76% of all STI. So, uh, when we think about how to uh, contain STIs in people uh, using PrEP, we have to focus on these 25% of participants who are responsible for the majority of STI diagnosed in people on PrEP. So how could we contain STI in PrEP users? So we have to uh, um, uh, use uh, some of the lessons we, we learn with HIV and start with A, B, and C, abstain, be faithful, and condoms, which are, you know, behavioral um, intervention that may uh, actually uh, contain uh, the rate of STIs. Um, in the prep study, again, in Australia, there was an interesting multivariate analysis to look at the predicting factors of STI in this population of PrEP users. And as you can see on this slide, uh, three factors were identified as associated with uh, a risk of STI younger age, uh, a number of uh, anal sex partners. So if you increase the number of anal sex partners, you increase your rate of STIs. Group sex also was associated with an increased rate of STIs. 
But as you can see here, uh, even though there was a, uh, a trend toward an increase in STI with, uh, without the use of condoms, this increase was not significant. Uh, and, and these data actually tell us that, of course, uh, we have to uh, recommend the use of condoms in people using PrEP, but uh, actually that might not, may not be the main driver of uh, STIs in PrEP users. And actually we should uh, try to uh, let them understand that they have probably to reduce also the number of the sexual partners. What about uh, uh, data from another uh, PrEP study that we are conducting in France in the Paris region, where you can see in red over time, the uh, increasing rate of STIs uh, in this population. Uh, and uh, you know, after 18 months, we had an incidence rate that was close to 100 per 100 person years. And we were uh, you know, able to look at the rate of STI during the COVID-19 lockdown. Um, and uh, it was interesting to see that during uh, the lockdown, there was a significant drop in STI incidence from 100 percent to uh, less than 20 percent. And, and of course, uh, that, that is evidence that, you know, abstinence could induce a reduction in STI incidence. But of course, this is not a viable uh, long term option for these people. So what else could we do? Vaccine is clearly very attractive. And, you know, this is similar for, to the COVID-19 epidemic, uh, where we are looking forward to seeing a vaccine being available. That's the same for uh, vaccines for STI. We have very good vaccines for viral STIs, but we don't have any uh, vaccines for bacterial STIs right now. And we are, you know, developing more research in order to have these or to make these vaccines available in, in the future. For viral STIs, although we have good vaccines, we still have to use them better. And if we look at these data from Taiwan, you can see that uh, uh, at, at the end of 2015, they were able to identify two HIV infected individuals who had acute hepatitis A infection. And a couple of months later, you know, uh, they were able to uh, document an outbreak of acute hepatitis A infection in Taiwan with nearly 1500 cases, most of them among MSM, and most of them among MSM who had HIV co-infection. So they implemented a public health strategy with uh, the implementation of the hepatitis A vaccine for all HIV infected individuals and all individuals who attended STD clinics. And within a couple of months, uh, they saw a, a strong decline in the number of new acute hepatitis A infection. And when they conducted the multivariate analysis to identify predicting factors of acute hepatitis A in these uh, individuals, they uh, identify a recent history of syphilis as being associated with acute hepatitis A. And also uh, they were able to uh, uh, identify the high effectiveness of hepatitis A vaccines since uh, individuals who receive a single dose or two doses of vaccine were highly protected with an effectiveness that was uh, above 96%. So clearly uh, in people on PrEP, you have to document and to make sure that these people have protection uh, against hepatitis A, against hepatitis B, because we have very effective vaccines. What about antibiotic prophylaxis? This is a very controversial issue uh, for um, STI uh, today. Uh, we presented two years ago uh, the results of a randomized study among MSM uh, using PrEP in France, and where uh, actually we randomized them to uh, receive either doxycycline post-exposure prophylaxis within 24 hours after sex, people have to take 200 milligrams of doxycycline or no uh, post-exposure prophylaxis. In that study, uh, people in the doxy arm used a median of seven pills per month, so not a lot of pills, and each pills contain 100 milligram, 100 milligram of doxycycline. What we uh, saw after a median follow-up of 8.7 months in the uh, uh, panel A here was an overall reduction by 47% uh, of uh, the risk of bacterial STIs. If we looked at gonorrhea, there was no uh, difference in incidence, so no benefit. The benefit, however, was quite strong for chlamydia and syphilis, 
where the uh, reduction, the relative reduction in, in incidence of chlamydia and syphilis was nearly 70%. So following these results, uh, an, a couple of people um, in Australia and the UK started to use doxycycline for uh, STI prophylaxis. We don't think this is a good idea. And although it's a limited number of people who are using doxycycline prophylaxis, I think at this point, it is not recommended to use this prophylaxis because we are not sure uh, the efficacy is high enough and is consistent if uh, we repeat the study. So we have a single study at this point with a limited number of people. And uh, on the top of that, we need to really assess the impact of this prophylaxis on resistance. I mean, we don't want to induce uh, resistance of chlamydia and syphilis to doxycycline with this strategy. So we need to do more studies and there are a number of ongoing trials in Canada, France, in the US as well, uh, and in South Africa to really assess uh, within the, the setting of a randomized study whether there is any harm of uh, using this prophylaxis. We also need to assess its impact on the microbiome uh, overall because uh, antibiotic prophylaxis could have, as we know, an impact on other uh, bacteria, of course. And an interesting um, uh, strategy that is being tested in Australia right now is the use of an oral mouthwash uh, to uh, prevent uh, oropharyngeal gonorrhea. Indeed, in a pilot study among MSM, these investigators were able to show that the use of a alcohol containing mouthwash for five minutes, you uh, gargle with the mouthwash for five minutes. And this uh, uh, treatment was able to reduce the rate of positive culture uh, in people who had oropharyngeal uh, gonorrhea from 84% to 52%. So there seems to be uh, some activity here. And that's why our Australian colleagues started a randomized control trial to see whether the daily use of these alcohol containing mouthwash would be able to reduce the risk of acquiring oropharyngeal gonorrhea among MSM. And we know that oropharyngeal gonorrhea is quite frequent in this population. So what about the test and treat strategy? That's a strategy which has proven to be quite successful uh, to contain the HIV epidemic. Uh, what about STIs? Uh, we have models from the CDC uh, which uh, let us think that if we uh, test more frequently STIs, the yellow line is testing STI every year. Uh, here with the purple line is every month. Uh, if we test more frequently uh, these individuals for, for STI, and if we treat uh, all people diagnosed with STI here in yellow, we may be able over the course of the next 10 years to reduce by 40% uh, the rate of uh, gonorrhea and chlamydia in PrEP users. And um, of course, with uh, uh, STIs now in people on PrEP, because we, we test them more frequently, we diagnose a lot of asymptomatic STIs, which would have missed, have been missed if we uh, were not testing these individuals. And we may think that, you know, uh, more frequent testing, more frequent treatment, earlier treatment may prevent transmission to uh, their partners. Do we have any real life data? Well, in France, we were quite surprised to see in 2016, and that was confirmed in 2017, that you know the increasing rate of syphilis actually was uh, replaced by a plateau in the number of syphilis cases among MSM in orange here. And although uh, MSM represented 81% uh, of all cases and 36% had co-infection with HIV and gonorrhea, this plateau here which was seen just at the time of PrEP uh, rollout in France with more testing for STI, more treatment for STI, might be, you know, um, the first example of the success of such a strategy. And of course, we, we need to, uh, you know, uh, be uh, careful, cautious, and uh, wait for additional data in 2018, 2019 to, to make sure that this is indeed true. Let's uh, finish by partner notification and treatment. This is also an important strategy uh, to uh, try to contain STIs in, in PrEP users. And I would like to uh, uh, remind you of a study that was done in uh, South America, in Peru. So you might be very familiar with that study conducted among MSM to see whether expedited treatment of sex partners uh, would increase partner notification. 
And in that study, 173 MSM with STI were randomized to receive either standard counseling for their partners or counseling plus a prescription of two antibiotics, cefixime and azithromycin. And the primary outcome of the study was to see whether there was an increase in self-report notification of the partners. And indeed, in people who received ATP, there was an increase in uh, the proportion of partners notified, 83% as compared to 58% with standard partner referral. So that was encouraging. However, you know, uh, we were disappointed to see that the rate of recurrent chlamydia gonorrhea in these individuals was actually uh, not reduced uh, by ETP. So there is more work to be done in this area and more studies to uh, carry out. So in summary, uh, uh, we, we know that following PrEP implementation, uh, there has been high rates of chemical sex and high rates of STI diagnosed also because we are testing more frequently this individual. But what's important to underline is that these high rates of STI and uh, condomless sex did not undermine the high efficacy of PrEP uh, to protect individuals against HIV acquisition. We need to uh, test for STI more frequently in order to make an early diagnosis and repeat treatment uh, with better partner notification. This should help to reduce STI incidence in PrEP users. Of course, we need to do more research and test new behavioral and biomedical strategies and we probably need to uh, push for vaccine development and vaccine for bacterial STIs in particular. Obviously, community and individual empowerment is key to address this issue of STIs in PrEP. And we know there are no magic bullets here. Uh, and we need uh, sustained efforts and combined approaches in order to uh, address uh, this issue of STI epidemic, in particular among PrEP users. And uh, overall, there is a, a need to uh, renew focus on STI research now. Uh, we have documented this increase in STIs among MSM, not only among PrEP users. And so we need to do more research now to, to meet the 2030 uh, WHO UNAIDS goal to reduce the incidence of STIs and HIV by 90%. I'd like now to uh, thank you for your attention and for listening to this presentation. And I will uh, conclude by acknowledging my team in Paris, where you're welcome to visit us and to work with us if you're interested in PrEP and STIs. And I would like also to thank our funders and sponsors over the years uh, with our PrEP and STI studies. Thank you. Bye-bye. Uh, well, thank you, Professor Molina, for your speaking. It was very interesting. And now we are going to start the question and answer section. I have four questions, so feel free to answer the one you feel more, more comfortable. The first one is, what information, most important action, is currently needed to effectively scale up testing of STIs? In your opinion, what is the role of the government within national health programs in the term of raising awareness on PrEP and STI? What are the biggest challenges and barriers to scaling up testing of STIs in the region? And what needs to be done to facilitate access to testing of STIs and PrEP for key and vulnerable populations? Please, doctors. Thank you, Camilla. Thank you very much for your kind comments. It, it, it's a very important issue, actually. And um, I think you, uh, you need to have clear guidelines in your government to uh, uh, recommend testing for STIs. Uh, and um, the, uh, so, so that it would be uh, easier for a clinician and for patients to understand, you know, that they need to be tested. And what we have learned with PrEP uh, is that, you know, people are coming to see their doctor to uh, get the prescription. Uh, but what they are most concerned about is uh, whether or not they have an STI. And they are very happy to know that they have no STIs and they have no risk of transmitting STIs to their uh, partner. The other limiting issue uh, with STIs we are facing right now is the cost of testing. And, um, you know, what we, we need to do is to uh, uh, be able to provide, you know, testing for STIs at low cost for individuals. Uh, there are multiple options to do that. Uh, 
that that's a, a key uh, element of you know acceptability and implementation of uh, testing for STI. And the last uh, uh, issue I'd like to mention is also uh, the issue of rapid testing. Uh, in order for people to be, uh, you know, uh, to accept to be tested and to understand the, uh, the role of STIs, it's important that the results could be available quite soon after testing so that people could receive treatment in due time and uh, be treated before they can transmit these STIs to their partners. So I think, you know, guidelines, costs, and uh, rapid turnover time to uh, obtain the results these are key issues in uh, you know, an, an STI strategy in people using PrEP. Thank you, Professor yeah. Molina. A any comment, Professor Meyer? Yes, I, I agree with uh, uh, Professor Molina. I would only add that number one, um, each country, each city really needs to look at uh, where STI testing can be done. Uh, you know, syphilis testing is very easy. There obviously is quality, there are quality assurance issues but the technology is 19th century technology still when we're using um, antibody tests for, uh, for confirmatory testing. So we need, we need improvements in how we diagnose syphilis, but for the time being, the tests that we have available are fairly simple. But for gonorrhea and chlamydia in particular, we really should be using NAT testing uh, and you know, that in, involves expensive machines. But in, in many countries, there are machines that are used to test for TB or used to test for other pathogens that use the same technology, um, um, the nucleic acid amplification. And there really needs to be a more um, holistic look rationally about can the central lab that does the TB testing also test for gonorrhea and chlamydia? Because we know that um, using um, culture for gonorrhea um, and trying to test for chlamydia, uh, unless you're doing nucleic acid amplification testing, you're really not doing the best testing that has the greatest sensitivity and specificity. And many of these SDIs are asymptomatic, so you're going to miss a lot if you just say, well, I treat uh, syndromically or I only uh, screen syndromically. We also need to make sure that providers are culturally aware and competent so they get a full sexual history because just because somebody's urine test or urethral test is negative does not mean that their rectal test or their oropharyngeal test will be negative. So we have to be able to get enough of a history to know where to screen as well. So that's also part part of the puzzle. And a lot of this, again, relates to really training the provider workforce so that people are more comfortable talking about sex, talking about SCIs, and then knowing how to best screen, diagnose, and treat. Well, thank you, Professor Mayer. Well, thank you to our speakers for presenting and participating, participating in this session, especially during this special and very busy time of the year. We would like also, thanks for all the participants, and we hope that this session has been helpful and interesting for you. We also encourage you to share the recording of this session with your colleagues who were not able to participate with us today. They will be able soon at the EIS Education Fund webpage. We hope that the information shared during this meeting will help you to take action, action to reduce the gaps between scientists advance and implementation and personal and professional levels, but also in your action at the local and regional level in America. Thank you all, take care of yourself and enjoy the next section on HIV cure and vaccine research. Thank you, professors. Thank you, Marika. Bye-bye. Gracias. Bye.
Hola, muy buenas tardes, muy buenas noches para algunos, quizás buenos días para algunos. Es un honor estar aquí en esta sesión. Les doy la bienvenida a la reunión de la IIS, Educational Fund, en colaboración con el Congreso de la Sociedad Argentina de Infectología 2020. Quiero dar la bienvenida a todos los participantes de esta reunión conjunta bajo el tema Ciencia y Comunidad en la Respuesta al VIH y con Infecciones en América Latina. Soy la doctora Claudia Cortés, médico infectólogo de la Universidad de Chile, vicepresidente de la Sociedad Chilena de Infectología y miembro del Governing Council de la International AIDS Society. Esta cuarta sesión la vamos a centrar en las investigaciones sobre la cura del VIH y las vacunas, incluidas las últimas actualizaciones sobre estas dos esferas de gran importancia para la respuesta al VIH. Tenemos dos excelentes ponentes, incluyendo la doctora Sharon Lewin, presidente electa de la AIS y directora del Peter Doherty Institute of Infection and Immunity de Melbourne, Australia. También nos acompaña el doctor Jorge Sánchez, subdirector del Centro de Investigaciones Tecnológicas, Biomédicas y Medioambientales de Perú. Ambos tienen un muy extenso currículum y la verdad es que yo me voy a centrar en escuchar sus presentaciones y más adelante les puedo ir contando un poco más de ellos. Thanks very much. It's a great pleasure for me to be able to present to you today. I'm going to discuss advances in the science towards a cure for HIV and potential pathways to the clinic. So I think everyone knows that HIV cure is rare, but certainly possible. The first person to be cured of HIV was of course Timothy Brown, who unfortunately died just two months ago from recurrence of his leukemia. He was cured following transplantation from a CCR5 or resistant donor and remained off antiretroviral therapy with no detectable virus for over 10 years. And so it was an inspiration for many of us working in the field that a cure is possible. For many years, we didn't know if this could be repeated And then 10 years later, Adam Castileo from London was reported to also have been cured of HIV following a um, bone marrow transplant from a CCR5 negative donor. So this really did confirm that we can do this. The question is how to make it available and safe to the 37 million people living with HIV. Earlier this year, we heard about Lorraine Willenberg from San Francisco. Lorraine's never been on antiretroviral therapy, hasn't received a transplant, but has successfully controlled her virus for over 20 years. And we've traditionally thought of this as elite control. However, what was discovered with Lorraine was that any virus that was there, and there were fragments of virus there, was defective. And we now think that this might be another pathway to a cure. Finally, we know that some people can undergo post-treatment control or remission, meaning they can keep their virus under control after a short period on antiretroviral therapy. This was first described in France, but then larger studies performed in the US, showing that in people who initiate treatment in the first six months of infection, what we call acute infection, can stop, when they stop treatment, about 10% can keep the virus under control. So the overall goal is can we mimic what has happened in these individuals in the 37 million people living with HIV, allowing them to safely stop treatment. Now I'm going to briefly give you an update on new concepts in our understanding of HIV latency. I'll then talk about clinical strategies for an HIV cure with a focus on immunotherapy, broadly neutralizing antibodies and gene therapy. And finally, talk about some of the thinking and how we might one day implement an HIV cure. So there are two forms of HIV infected cells. One is productive infection, where the virus enters an activated CD4 T cell and replicates. That cell will be positive for DNA, positive for RNA, positive for proteins, and generally will die. We also know about latent infection. In this form of virus, the virus gets into the DNA of a cell and therefore is detected as DNA positive, but doesn't produce RNA, doesn't produce proteins, and therefore survives. What we've learned though is that it's not as simple as two forms of infection. 
there's actually a spectrum of activity between productive and latent infection. And this occurs even in people on antiretroviral therapy. So some of the new concepts in HIV persistence and latency that we've learned over the last 12 to 24 months include, first of all, reservoir activity. The virus is not always silent or fast asleep. It can intermittently activate or it can dribble out very low levels of virus in people on treatment, what we now call the active reservoir. Lately infected cells can proliferate and we know this because we can find cells with the identical integration site. This couldn't happen by chance, it's happened by proliferation and that is a new target for HIV cure. We know that position matters. Where the virus integrates is actually really important. And earlier this year, we learned that in a subset of elite controllers, people who can naturally control their virus, the virus is in a special part of the DNA, which allows it to stay silent, perhaps indefinitely. And finally, we know that on treatment, most of the virus is actually defective, meaning it's got mistakes and errors in it and can't really replicate. It's like a graveyard of viral sequences. And this is the dominant form. And in fact, there's very few um, cells that have intact virus. And we've got much better ways of measuring defective and intact virus and getting far better insights into what happens with intact virus rather than total virus on antiretroviral therapy and following interventions. And the news is good there. It looks like intact virus does decay to some extent. So what are some of the clinical strategies for an HIV cure? Well, the overall goal is to eliminate these latently infected cells. If you were able to eliminate every latently infected cell, essentially what happened with Timothy Brown, we call this eradication. Alternatively, if we could just reduce the amount of infected cells and enhance the immune system to facilitate long-term control, this would allow people to safely stop antiretroviral therapy, but the virus is always there at low levels. And we commonly call this remission. Currently, the strategies are aimed at both. We ultimately would like to achieve eradication but most of the work so far is really targeted at achieving remission. So the strategies to achieve an HIV cure are targeting the virus, reducing the amount that's left on treatment and bolstering the immune system. And there's multiple ways to do this, to reduce the amount of virus that persists on antiretroviral therapy. And I've named some of those interventions here and at the same time, boost immunity. And I'm going to just talk about a few of these strategies, um, namely latency reversal, immunomodulation, and a very little bit about broadly neutralizing antibodies, and finally summarize what's happening in the world of gene therapy. So latency reversing agents, um, we have traditionally called shock and kill, drugs that push the virus out of its hiding place so that the immune system can now see the infected cell and eliminate it, effectively convert, converting a latently infected cell to a productively infected cell. And there are many latency reversing agents that have been developed in the lab, some that have been tested in clinic, clinical trials, and probably the most active agents currently under investigation are these drugs called SMAC mimetics, but they have not yet been in people only encouraging data from animal models. What we've learned from clinical trials though, is that there still is a need for more potent and less toxic latency reversing agents that we can move into the clinic. We've learned that we can shock the virus, but we can't yet kill those cells. And there's a, a, an amount of work now going into effectively getting the kill into shock and kill through pro-apoptotic drugs or drugs that enhance cell death. There are though immunomodulatory latency reversing agents and these have the dual activity of targeting the virus and the immune system and the drugs I'm going to talk about are immune checkpoint blockers and TLR agonists and these are attractive because they target both the virus and the immune system. 
Vesitolomide is a TLR7 agonist that's been extensively studied in animal models. It has immunomodulating activities and is now being used in multiple combination cure studies. It probably has some activity as a latency reversing agent that's been shown in vitro and in some non-human primates, but its real role is in immunomodulation and that's shown on the right, the activity it has on different markers of the immune system. In one non-human primate study, the combination of TLR7 agonists with antibodies actually led to cure in 50% of animals, which has given people a lot of optimism that this agent's going to be important. And just a few weeks ago, we heard the results of the first clinical trial of Visitolomod, a TLR7 agonist developed by Gilead in people living with HIV on antiretroviral therapy. The study was a dose escalating double blind placebo controlled trial in 48 individuals and it was shown to be safe with minor adverse effects and it had clear immune enhancing effects at doses greater than four milligrams and this is just shows you some of the um, immuno enhancing effects. Interestingly it had no latency reversal at least on its own and they're now going to be and many studies underway combining visitolomod with other immune enhancing agents. One of the agents that will be, it will be combined with a broadly neutralizing antibodies. I'm sure many people know about these. These are derived from HIV infected individuals. The source of those antibodies or B cells is cloned ex vivo. And there's a very large number of HIV neutralizing antibodies, some of them very potent that are now in the clinic. They're being investigated to prevent HIV. They've been investigated in place of antivirals. And we also know that in people living with HIV who receive an antibody and then stop treatment, there's prolonged time to viral rebound. So they are thought to have a role in cure strategies. Finally, we've been interested for many years in anti-PD-1, a drug that can reverse the exhaustion of the immune system and potentially help control virus off treatment. We recently completed a study together with Afam Okoye and uh, Lewis Picker where monkeys were infected with virus, put on treatment, suppressed just like someone on ART and then given anti-PD-1 or a control antibody. And I'm going to show you the results um, as uh, according to this legend. Now, when we looked at the time to rebound in these monkeys, there was no difference. Everyone rebound, all the monkeys rebounded mostly within 10 days after stopping treatment. But when we looked at control after stopping antiretroviral therapy, and this is viral load that rebounds, you can see the control antibody in blue, it stays at a very high level. But in monkeys that received anti-PD-1, viral load is reduced by two logs. This is not good enough for a cure, but clearly shows that anti-PD-1 can enhance immune function. Now what's happening in combining some of these strategies in the clinic? Well, there are a number of combination immunotherapy studies now underway. Um, this is a summary of some of them that have been reported um, including river and roadmap, and some of them that are still enrolling. And they largely combine latency reversing agents with antibodies or vaccines. And then there are many other immunomodulatory agents that I haven't discussed, interferon alpha, IL-15 superagonist and others. And the results we should hear of some of these studies um, in the coming one to two years. Finally, gene therapy. Gene therapy is important because we now have much better ways to edit the DNA. This allows um, for multiple ways we could tackle the virus. First of all, gene therapy can use to attack or enhance anti-HIV immune responses. It can be used to protect where you can engineer uninfected cells to be resistant to HIV or it could be used to purge, which means directly eliminate the virus, target the gene editing to tools to the virus itself. The real challenge for gene therapy is the delivery. At the moment, most gene therapy is delivered ex vivo, gene editing outside the body, which needs to be then reinfused. 
However, advances in in vivo gene editing could really change um, the options for gene therapy for HIV. This is an example of ex vivo gene therapy for CCR5 modification. Cells are taken out, modified ex vivo. The CCR5 negative cells are then reinfused back into the person living with HIV on treatment. And we know this approach is safe, and we just need to get it to be more effective or higher levels of um, gene modified cells. What's really exciting over the last few years is hearing about in vivo gene therapy, where you can deliver the gene editing tool with either nanoparticles or an adeno associated virus. And studies delivering gene therapy to produce broadly neutralizing antibodies were recently reported at Croy this year. Finally, and importantly, how will we one day get any of this into the community or implement an HIV cure? Well, if you look at what we have available for HIV treatment now and in the future, here we are in 2020 with highly effective antiretroviral therapy, that's oral. In the coming months, or maybe within one to two years, we'll have long acting or injectable antiretroviral therapy either as tablets or either as injections of ART or broadly neutralizing antibodies. So cure strategies um, would likely initially be targeting HIV remission with combination immunotherapy. Hopefully we'll then move into seeing ex vivo cures or gene or cellular therapy moving into the clinic, followed by in vivo cure and the ultimate goal to get a single shot cure for everyone. Now, I don't know when this is going to happen, but I think one could expect that we will have some forms of immuno, combination immunotherapy, um, which would at least allow for remission as one pathway to get to this final goal. Together with the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation and the IAS, we've been developing a conversation around what a target product profile for an HIV cure might look like. And this combines what will be useful to the community with what will be possible from the science. The target product profile is commonly used in drug development. It aligns all stakeholders by defining a cure product that people living with HIV actually want delivered. It defines the minimally acceptable and optimistic characteristics of a cure in relation to a whole lot of parameters like efficacy, toxicity, cost, who it's for, how it's transported, et cetera. And we've already started a consultation with a number of experts and community where we did a range of, in, um, of, um, of interviews in person and verbally and an online exercise trying to define the minimally acceptable and optimistic, optimistic characteristics. And these data should be published shortly, um, in fact, hopefully on World AIDS Day. So just in summary, there are many new concepts in understanding HIV latency. There are new tools now being used to understand how the virus persists beyond just quantifying the virus as DNA or RNA. Combination immunotherapy approaches are most advanced, including using TLR agonists, antibodies and vaccines. Anti-PD-1 may also play a role, although there is some safety concerns with this intervention. There's some optimism for gene therapy, including strategies to attack, purge and protect from the virus using both ex vivo and now in vivo approaches. And finally, there's active discussions right now with funders, industry and community about what a target product profile for cure will look like. And the overall goal is to ensure that any advance we have scientifically Will be delivered quickly to those at highest need and in a form that's acceptable to the community. I'd like to acknowledge um, all of my colleagues uh, at the Doherty Institute in Melbourne who've contributed to much of the research that I've done over many, many years and done all of the hard work. Many of our um, collaborators and funders, thanks very much. I am Jorge Sanchez, Principal Investigator of the dates funded Clinical Trial Unit in Peru, Vice President of the Centro de Investigaciones Tecnológicas, Biomédicas y Medioambientales in Lima, Peru, uh, Affiliate Professor of the Department of Global Health at the University of Washington, and HBTN Co-Chair of the Mosaico Trial that I will 
talk about in the, during this presentation. I have no conflict of interest. And uh, in this first slide, um, I want to show the differences among between regions of the populations affected by HIV. Although HIV has slowed down uh, during the last years in the world, there is still 38 million people infected and over 1.7 million people are infected every year. This slide shows in circles the population affected by the region. Uh, you can see, for instance, that in South Africa, the uh, pink circle represents young women, while in the Southeast Asia, the purple circle represents um, uh, people who inject drugs. And these are the main people in, affected by the infection in this region. As you see in the Americas, the populations that are more in, uh, affected by the infection, HIV infection, are men who have sex with men and transgender women who are represented in green and gr light green circles across the Americas. Um, the prevention has been evolved during the uh, last uh, years. And uh, um, this slide shows a mosaic of different Stra prevention strategies. Each tile is a strategy. We can see undetectable means untransmissible, condom use, mutual monogamy, and PrEP. PrEP has evolved during the last 10 years a lot. In, 12, in year 2012, uh, was approved and, uh, to use TDF and FTC uh, to use daily to prevent HIV. After that, uh, it has been um, effective also in, during the same year in 2012, shown that four tablets per week has the same, most, more or less the same effectiveness of every day. And this was using the STRAN study uh, with in combination with the data of the IPERG study. After that, the IPERG study shows effectiveness also using or prep on demand, two tablets 24 hours before sex and one tablet 24, hour, uh, 24 hours after sex and another tablet 24 hours after. Uh, recently, in 2019, the TAF have shown uh, no infamiliarity results with TDF FTC. And this year, intramuscular cabotegravir has shown superiority to TDF FTC. It means that PrEP has been evolved a lot during the last decade and will continue to be evolving. However, the tire of the vaccine has not been filled and requires to be filled for people who, for that the other strategies do not work or they don't, do not desire to use. Uh, why is it difficult to find a vaccine? There are many reasons. Immediate and reversible HIV integration in the host genoma is one of them. No immunogen has been designed and predicted yet able to elicit broadly neutralizing antibodies. Immune correlation of protection are unclear, sorry for the typos, and natural infection and recovery do not occur providing no mechanism of action for a vaccine to emulate. No validated preclinical models of disease transmission has been uh, used uh, are not usable, but more importantly, there is an extensive HIV clade and sequence diversity. There are nine subtypes and more than 50 recombinant, recombinant forms shown in the um, uh, figure 
to the right. And you can see the different uh, subtypes and different recombinant that forms by region. Uh, this slide shows you the different trials 2B and 3 uh, that has been uh, undergone in the last 30 years. Um, we, there has been a lot of research and there is only one trial that has shown uh, efficacy and that trial is named the PI trial. It's uh, the, the one who is in the middle here and this trial um, um, it has shown efficacy. It, uh, the Thai trial used four priming injections of a recombinant Karamifox vector plus two booster injections of a recombinant glycoprotein 120 subunit vaccine. After three years of follow up, the efficacy was around uh, 31%. Uh, with this information, um, HVTN modified the um, regimen to implement HVTN 702, shown here below, which has been implemented between 2016 and 2020. This uh, 702, HVTN 702 vaccine uh, trial used a vaccine regimen consisted of two experimental vaccines. A Karanipox vector based vaccine called ADAC HIV and two component GP120 protein subunits vaccines with no, with an adjutant to enhance the, the body immune response to the vaccines. Both ADAC HIV supplied by Sanofi Pasteur and the protein vaccine supplied by GSK were modified from the versions used in the type trial to be specific to the HIV subtype C in South Africa. This study was performed uh, in South Africa for uh, young women. Additionally, the protein subunit vaccine in the HVTN702 was combined with MF59, a different adjuvant that the one used in the Tybax and Type trial in the hope to, of generating a more robust and durable immune response. Finally, the HVTN702 vaccine regimen included a boosted shots at the one year and 18 month time points in an effort to prolong the early protective effective shown in the entire uh, trial. Unfortunately, uh, this trial showed no effects. Um, besides these uh, trials, in this slide also sh is shown trials done in MSN, like the uh, IVAX trial, the STEP and Pambi and the STEP trial between 2004 and 2007, and the, the HVTN 505 trial, all of them were non-effective among MSM. Uh, uh, these trials were basically done in the Americas. Research done from 2004 and on, on and supported by Johnson & Johnson has shown in the last few years promising results. In 2016, the study approach assessed the safety and tolerability of various regimens. Participants were primed at weeks 0 and 12 with adenovirus 26 mosaic HIV, expressing mosaic, mosaic HIV envelope in GAC and Paul, and were boosted with adenovirus 26 mosaic HIV or modified vaccine and CARA, with or without low or high dose of aluminum adjuvant clay C envelope GP140. The HIV adenovirus 26 at 26 plus the high dose of GP140 boost vaccine was the most immunogenic 
in humans. The same regimens were used in uh, rhesus monkeys that were actually have a very good immunogenic results. And these monkeys were rectally challenged at least six times with a decrease in the infectiousness of 67%. After this study, the second study here, the Traverse study, uh, showed that the tetravalent mosaic HIV vaccine induced a superior magnitude of cellular and tumoral um, responses, immunity than the trivalent vaccine. This vaccine concept is currently being evaluated for efficacy in young women in Southern Africa in the HPTN 705 study or in Bokodo trial with a final enrollment of 20, over 26,000 people. Aiming to expand the scope of global coverage, the ASIM study here uh, included an HIV mosaic GP140. And this, the, the data here show broader immune responses. The adenovirus tetravalent HIV and the bivalent GP140 selected at final rating for a phase three trial, which is the one used in the mosaic trial, which is starting November 2019. Therefore, we have currently two trials using similar uh, schemas. The Invocodo trial, which is at phase 2B in Southern Africa, predominantly in plate C, heterosexual women that have an intravaginal transmission and have a limited PrEP use. On the other hand, we have the Mosaic trial, which is a phase 3 trial. Uh, uh, which is a phase three trial uh, done in the Americas and Europe, where the, pre the predominant clay is the clay B. The target population are MSM and transgender women, which have an intrarectal transmission, and there is an increased PrEP use expected. The primary objective of the Mosaic trial is to evaluate the vaccine efficacy of an heterologous vaccine regimen utilized, utilizing adenovirus 26, mosaic tetravalent mosaic HIV, and aluminum phosphate adjuvate, clay C GP140, and mosaic GP140 for the prevention of HIV in HIV seronegative cisgender men and transgender individuals, having sex with cisgender men and or transgender individuals. The primary endpoint is confirmed HIV infection diagnosed between seven months and on, and will be followed for 24 to 30 months after the last injection. Secondary objectives are to evaluate the safety and radiotogenicity, to evaluate the vaccine efficacy at other time points and in other analysis, uh, sub analysis populations to evaluate immune responses elicited by the vaccine regimen, and to evaluate the vaccine efficacy by and adjusting for potential compounders. Here is the schema of the Bocycle trial. We see here two groups, the intervention group and the placebo group. The intervention group will have four points of vaccination. The first two points at zero and three months will receive at the Novarus 26 mosaic tetravalent HIV vaccine. And this vaccine will be uh, included a clay C plus a mosaic GP140 in the vaccination in month six and month 12. And will be followed as mentioned for 24 to 30 months uh, for the primary analysis. Uh, this study is, uh, has been powered at 90% to reject the nanopotencies of the vaccine efficacy less than 20% under an assumed vaccine efficacy of 65%.
The sites where the Bamsaiko study uh, uh, is done is in the Americas and Europe. There are 22 sites in the US, three sites in Mexico, five sites in Peru, eight sites in Brazil, four in Argentina. And in Europe, there are two sites in Poland, three in Italy, and six in Spain. This slide shows the current enrollment up to November this year. Uh, you can see there are 491 enrollment. The countries that have enrolled more are Peru and the US, and the other uh, countries have just started and is uh, uh, progressing the enrollment. Um, uh, we, I want to show here the mechanism of PREP mosaic. We know that PREP is effective, and there are different stages in our Latin American countries uh, of the coverage of PREP. So we, are, uh, we wanted that everybody who wanted to be in mosaic had the chance to choose PrEP. Participants in the screening were counseled about PrEP and linked to PrEP services during the PrEP screening processes if they are interested. Linkage to PrEP services occur instead of trial participation. Science link interest people to PrEP service. Potential participants who declined to use PrEP were screened and enroll in the trial. After enrollment, if participants change their mind and decide to use PrEP at any time during the trial, they are linked to PrEP services or provide PrEP at the site. Also, they have approved PrEP access plans for both the screening and post-enrollment periods. And all participants need to get all of their HIV tests through the study site because of vaccine-induced seropositivity. What is vaccine-induced seropositivity or seroreactivity? Uh, the vaccine is creating antibody responses. That's the goal of an HIV vaccine. Most of HIV, common HIV tests, they take HIV antibodies, not the virus itself. The vaccine recipients may produce antibodies against HIV proteins in the vaccine. Therefore, vaccine-induced seropositive occurs when antibodies created by the vaccine causes a reactive results on the standard HIV test. Can, this can be misinterpreted as a sign of HIV infection in a healthy study participant. And therefore, every participant should test their uh, HIV testing at, at the site. In summary, uh, despite prevention efforts, MSA in Latin America remain a substantial risk of HIV acquisition. Although data among transgender women is scanned and in established, established HIV surveillance systems, the studies indicates high prevalence in this group. Deployment of prevention strategies such as treatment prevention and PrEP is slow, especially in Latin America. Therefore, there is a momentum for finding an HIV vaccine. Ethical considerations have been taken in the signing of Mosaic. A Mosaic study deployment is underway. All the sites participating in Mosaic has a PrEP plan in place. And this is common, and participants should take HIV tests only at their CRSs or clinical research sites. I want to thank the Janssen team, especially Sabrina Spinoza, who has shared their slides, and the HV team and team. Thanks so much.
Thank you very much. Now I will go in English so our guests can uh, understand the question easily. Uh, remember that everybody can send your questions uh, in the Q&A box, so please send us all your doubts and questions. I want to thank Professor Sharon Lewin because for an excellent presentation and also Dr. Jorge Sanchez who will talk about vaccine and Dr. Lewin about cure. I have a couple of questions for both. Dr. Lewin, how do you uh, the shock and kill strategy uh, with these latency reversing agents? It uh, sounds very aggressive. How can what can you tell us about adverse effects your, the patients can maybe have? Well, first of all, none of the trials looking at latency reversing agents have shown a reduction in the reservoir. So it's important to understand that this won't be used on its own. What the studies have shown is that you can wake up the reservoir, which is the first step to eliminating it. So if we're going to use any latency reversing agents, it will be they'll be used in combination with other strategies. The adverse events from the shock and kill strategies that have been used so far are largely related to the drugs themselves. So the, the um, interventions have included uh, histone deacetylase inhibitors, they've got a range of adverse events. Um, Anti-PD-1 has a range of adverse events. And I, measured, I mentioned TLR7 agonists um, that were initially developed as a latency reversing agent. The idea that of increasing activity of the reservoir, that uh, today has no evidence of causing any harm because even if you produce more virus, it can't go on to infect cells in someone that's already on antiretroviral therapy. Okay, hey, thank you. Uh, Dr. Sanchez, uh, what do you think of the main difficulties you see in an HIV vaccine trial? Uh, recruiting patients, the active vaccine movements, do you think that these movements for these specific vaccines is going to be the same for the other vaccines and we have to deal with these movements? You're, you're, you need to open your mic. I'm so sorry. As I mentioned, there are so, several uh, potential drawbacks uh, in the development of a vaccine trial. And uh, recruitment retention is one of them. Uh, I think for MSN in the Americas, uh, uh, it has been going through different trials that has not been effective already. So since uh, late uh, 1990s, there have been trials among MSN in the Americas, and that might uh, have uh, um, some reluctance uh, in the community for this. And uh, trial sites need to work with the communities, trying to introduce the idea of, uh, of uh, that the trial will not produce uh, a major adverse event. Uh, the current uh, regimen of a mosaic 26 platform vector, vector platform, that has been used in almost a thousand hundred people in the world by other vaccines like Ebola, uh, respiratory syndrome uh, virus, and other viruses. So it's a, it's a, it's a safe platform. And uh, so far, what we are looking or what we are in, in the already uh, enrolled participants is, is that only produce um, local uh, sim uh, symptoms and um, signs and minor systemic signs. Obviously, we need to have a long follow-up to see if there are other long-term um, adverse events uh, showing up. But I think the one of the uh, good uh, news in this uh, trial is that it has been tested in macacus rhesus. We know that there is no real model for uh, reproduce the immune system of the human immune system in the monkeys. However, this uh, schema has been tested in, um, in monkeys, challenge, rectally challenged. So they have been introduced in the rectum uh, different uh, uh, quantities of virus and they had a 65% of uh, reduction 
you might remember that for PrEP, we start doing the same. We start doing challenging uh, 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 monkeys that, uh, go, uh, that receive PrEP and we find out that they were very um, successful in preventing HIV infection. So I think we have a, a, the hope that this new trial will work and, um, and um, so the sites in many Latin American sites are working hard to work with the community. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, Dr. Lewin, uh, how do you see the HIV treatment in 10 more years? What can I offer to my patients if you think in 10 more years? Well, I think in, um, in 10 years, we will have injectable um, antiretroviral therapy. I think that's a given. Um, we may well also have injectable antibody treatments and antibodies may have some advantages over antivirals with respect to adverse events and its potential that we can use antibodies um, that will last, say, six monthly injections. We might even have implants uh, where antiretrovirals are, are just like we have a contraception, we may have implants. I think if I look in 10 years, there's a very high chance that each of those will be available to patients as alternatives to daily oral treatment. With respect to cure strategies or something that we can give people so that they completely stop antiretrovirals, I'm really not sure we'll even have that in 10 years, actually. Um, if any of the things that we're trying work, um, the most likely thing that we will see first in the clinic are these combination, what I call combination immunotherapy. Um, a pro an approach that will reduce the reservoir and boost the immune system and allow people to stop treatment. But I think that's very uncertain when it will come to the clinic. Okay, this has been an amazing session, but we are getting to an end. Thank you to our speaker for presenting and participating in this session, especially during this special and um, very busy time of the year. We will also like to thank all the participants and we hope that this session can help and be interesting to you. We hope that the information shared during this session and this meeting will help you to take action to reduce the gap between scientific advances and implementation at a personal and professional level, but also in your actions to the local and regional in Latin America. Thank you all. Take care. Please take care about COVID. There's still a lot of COVID out there. And uh, I invite you to enjoy the next session, the next panel about stigma and discrimination. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Thank you. Bye bye.
Hola, buenas tardes eh, con todas, con todos y con todes. Eh, bienvenidos a la última sesión del día que tiene que ver con un tema muy eh, vincula, íntimamente vinculado con lo que se ha estado discutiendo el día de hoy, que es el estigma y la discriminación. Esta es la quinta sesión eh, que vamos a tener en español o portuñol en honor a la Sociedad Argentina de Infectología y a su 20 aniversario, una organización para todos nosotros muy importante, no solo a nivel académico, sino un socio recientemente en el mundo del activismo para mejorar la calidad de vida de las personas con enfermedades transmisibles y poniéndolas a ellas en el centro de la respuesta. La sesión tiene que ver con la ciencia y la comunidad en la respuesta al VIH y con infecciones en América Latina. Este es un evento organizado con el Fondo de Educación de la Sociedad Internacional de SIDA y, por supuesto, en la Sociedad Argentina de Infectología dentro de su congreso eh, y eh, quien les habla es Javier Roca de Veloc. Yo soy eh, editor y coordinador de Corresponsales Claves, eh, un equipo de periodistas comunitarios de la región. Digamos que esa es la peor parte de mi reputación, el resto se los ahorro. Y eh, en, en realidad la, la sesión de hoy se centrará en, en discutir en un breve panel eh, el tema de estigma y discriminación sobre el VIH eh, y para eso se ha seleccionado cuatro eh, panelistas de lujo, no me quiero comer el tiempo porque el panel va a ser muy breve, pero sí quiero presentar a la moderadora del panel, que es Claudia Velázquez, de Anucida, actualmente Anucida Brasil, una colega y compañera eh, con muchos años de trayectoria, eh, no, más allá de Anucida, eh, una persona que siempre nos ha, eh, ha aportado muchísimo conocimiento académico, pero también que viene de la respuesta del VIH y se conoce que la ciencia no es solo la respuesta para esta pandemia y por eso qué mejor para moderar el panel y presentar a los panelistas que Claudia en, hablando sobre estigma y discriminación. Muchas gracias Javier y eh, bienvenido y buenos a todos al panel. Eh, tenemos, voy a introducir brevemente nuestros cuatro panelistas. Tenemos a la señorita Karen Dunway de ICW Latina, Honduras. Ella es una activista desde pequeña. Actualmente está liderando una investigación. Nosotros sabemos, nosotros podemos. También tenemos a María José Hernández, que es integrante de ACEPO, Asociación de Ayuda al Cero Positivo de Uruguay. Eh, y también tenemos a Matías Muñoz, eh, que es activista, abogado y fundador de Asociación Ciclo Positivo. Y la última panelista es Silvia Martínez de Red Trans Nicaragua, actualmente coordinadora nacional de Red Trans desde el 2005 y también coordinadora de proyectos del Fondo Mundial. Entonces, eh, con eso eh, les quiero avisar a los panelistas que voy a hacer una ronda de preguntas introductorias. Les pido que, tra que traten de limitar sus respuestas a tres minutos y luego, eh, tiempo permitido, eh, quisiera iniciar una segunda ronda de, de preguntas. Entonces, la primera pregunta es para eh, Karen Dunway. Eh, ¿Qué pasos deberían ser realizados para colocar la lucha contra la estigma y discriminación como el eje principal de la prevención y tratamiento al VIH en su país. Karen. Hola a todos y todas. Eh, gracias por la invitación. Eh, yo creo, eh, y siendo este un punto muy necesario a recalcar, y lo hemos notado mucho en el área de jóvenes de ICW Latina, al momento de ejecutar nuestra investigación, que nosotros podemos, nosotros sabemos, de que es necesario evidenciar cómo el estigma afecta la vida de las personas con VIH, ya que como sabemos es una limitante para los derechos humanos de las personas. Y se deben hacer cambios en las políticas públicas para que las acciones de discriminación sean consideradas como delitos. Disminuir el, el estigma en parte depende del diseño, la aplicación, programas, políticas, leyes e investigaciones en que múltiples sectores se comunican y colaboran para lograr mejores resultados de la salud pública, porque el estigma es una barrera para las, el acceso a estos servicios de salud y también para lograr ambientes de trabajo, entorno social, familiar, libres de estigma. Eh, esto 
Esto de evidenciar no solo cae en el tema de, de investigación, que es diagnóstico y tener datos, porque en, este, en esta investigación que nosotros hemos estado haciendo hace ya un par de meses, nos hemos topado con la noticia de que casi no hay datos, específicamente de mujeres jóvenes VIH en Latinoamérica. Y eso nos da la limitación de saber en qué contexto estamos parados y cómo vamos a poder ac tener acciones específicas para disminuir el estigma de discriminación. Pero también en Latinoamérica, y cierro con esto porque quiero ser muy breve, se debe darle seguimiento a las campañas de estigma para que tengan un impacto permanente. No solo que sea uno, dos, tres meses, sino que sea largo para tener, para ver grandes efectos. Gracias. Muchas gracias, Karen. La siguiente pregunta introductoria será para María José. María José, ¿qué debería ser implementado para reducir la estigma y discriminación en los centros de salud? Bueno, buenas tardes para todas, todos, todes. Eh, reflexionando en este sentido, este, lo que yo llegué hoy como para aportar es que una de, la, de las claves es poder darnos cuenta y poder trabajar sobre el currículum oculto que los centros de salud de alguna manera tienen, ¿no? ¿Y a qué me refiero con el currículum oculto? Al sistema de valores, creencias, pensamientos, matrices de aprendizaje, modelos de sexualidad que cada persona que trabaja en ese centro de salud trae consigo, más allá de la formación académica por la que puede haber pasado o por la formación administrativa. No sé en los países donde viven ustedes, pero acá en la, en la carrera de medicina no existe eh, el espacio para la educación sexual integral, por lo tanto, no, no hay un lugar para la revisión de estos modelos de sexualidad, heteronormativos, eh, genitos centrados, androcéntricos, ¿no? un montón de creencias que hacen que este, no, no se puedan revisar. Entonces yo creo que lo primero que hay que implementar es ese trabajo de educación sexual integral permanente en los centros educativos, con, en los centros de salud, con todas las personas que allí trabajan. Y para mí esto, la clave fundamental es la presencia de las organizaciones, de la sociedad civil en los equipos de trabajo. No como algo accesorio, sino justamente como en una cuestión de equidad, de experticia y de saber para que esta, esto se pueda ir transformando. Este, pienso que tiene que haber material educativo al alcance de las personas, pienso que tiene que haber videos educativos desde un punto de vista positivo, no alarmantes. Eh, pienso que la consejería tiene que estar instalada acá en las guías y las pautas de tratamiento eh, eh, se sugiere y se exige que la consejería esté presente dentro del centro de salud, pero es algo que no se, implement, no se ha implementado y la sociedad civil por lo general es quien se encarga de eso. Eh, a veces nos olvidamos el vínculo que tiene esto con la sexualidad y la sexualidad es un tabú. Eh, las infecciones de transmisión sexual han sido concebidas durante mucho tiempo como castigo y eso, por más que nosotros y nosotras somos activistas, lo venimos trabajando, lo tenemos en nuestro cuerpo, esas personas que trabajan dentro de, sal de los centros de salud tal vez no están teniendo el espacio, la posibilidad producida para que puedan revisarse y transformarse hacia un paradigma eh, bueno, más acercado la, a la realidad, y este, más justo, más equitativo, y yo creo que eso reduciría, pero ampliamente, ese currículum oculto que recibimos cada vez que tenemos atención médica o que algún compañero o compañera este, se acerca al centro de salud. No sé si me pasé, perdón. Estuvo bien, María. Muchas gracias. Eh, la siguiente pregunta introductoria entonces será para Matías. Eh, Matías, ¿de qué manera puede el sistema de entrega de servicios de salud ayudar en la reducción del estigma y discriminación hacia personas que viven con el VIH? Bien, yo creo que coincido, coincido muchísimo con dice María José, ¿no? La información es una herramienta fundamental para poder... Creo que la, la discriminación, el estigma y la discriminación surgen a partir de la falta de información. Uno, eh, casi todos, casi todas las personas discriminamos o excluimos de alguna manera a, a otras personas. ¿sí? Y eso tiene que ver muchas veces con la falta de empatía, la falta de información, la falta de conocimiento. Hay algo que, que tengo para decirles, ¿no? Que muchas veces... Esta, estas situaciones se pueden reducir con esta información y con capacitación. No es nuevo decir que el estigma y la discriminación puede reducir con capacitación. Pero me parece que hay un cuello de botella que todavía no pudimos sortear y es en pensar a todo el equipo de salud, a todo el personal que trabaja en el sistema de salud como el equipo de salud. No, no, no solamente entender 
a la capacitación de los profesionales o las profesionales de la salud, psicólogos, psicólogas, médicos y médicas, ¿no? Pensar también en administrativos, en personal de seguridad, ¿no? Un, un punto muchas veces la puerta se cierra eh, en, ese, eh, en esa puerta de entrada eh, al llegar al equipo de salud. Pero creo que, que esto no es nuevo, no, no es algo que, estamos, que empezamos a decir en el 2020 o en el 2019 o ni siquiera en el 2018. Entender al equipo de salud como, un, como, como distintas personas que interactúan con nosotras, personas usuarias del sistema, es un desafío que todavía lo tenemos pendiente y que si bien lo venimos diciendo hace muchísimo tiempo, todavía no, llegamos a, no llevamos a la práctica la capacitación conjunta de todo el personal que trabaja en entonces, lo que tengo para decir por es, en, en esta primera instancia es eso, ¿no? Lo mismo que venimos diciendo hace mucho, pero llevarlo a la práctica. Realmente entender a todas las personas que trabajan en, un equipo, en, en el equipo de salud o en un servicio de salud como objetivo de las capacitaciones. Pero hay que hacerlo, hay que empezar a hacerlo. Y en segundo lugar, eh, es esta herramienta y esta estrategia fundamental que tenemos nueva desde hace algunos años, que si bien indetectable, igual e intransmisible, aplica solamente, ya lo sabemos, para personas con tratamiento más de seis meses y por vía sexual, el mensaje tiene una fuerza imparable. Y que digamos, que mencionemos que una persona con VIH no puede transmitir el virus, hace que esos miedos, que esa desinformación, se reduzca. Entonces, realmente, tomar en serio el mensaje, poder prestarle atención a la fuerza que tiene y a las consecuencias positivas, a los resultados positivos, que tiene este mensaje, es otra de las, de, las, de las posibles soluciones. Por eso, en resumen, son dos. Es empezar a hacer lo que venimos diciendo que hay que hacer, que es pensar en el equipo de salud eh, como, como, un, como una multiplicidad de, per, de personalidades, y en segundo lugar, darle a I igual a I el lugar que se merece. Muchas gracias, Matías. Eh, y vamos con en nuestra última pregunta con eh, la cuarta panelista. Um, Silvia, eh, ¿cuáles son los desafíos y barreras más grandes para poner fin al estigma y discriminación en su región o país? Antes que nada, explicar un poco que la región de Centroamérica en este preciso momento ha cambiado. Y esto se lo debemos al, a los dos huracanes que acaban de pasar. Eh, se cuentan en cientos de miles de personas aisladas, en crisis, crisis humanitaria, crisis sanitaria. Esto agrava el tema del acceso universal a los servicios de salud. Creo que... Eh, y, y también decir, ¿verdad?, de que eh, lo, los desafíos son muchos porque al final el sistema patriarcal tiene salida. Eh, pueden agregar, pueden decir que, ejemplo, como lo han dicho uno de los panelistas, el tema de la concepciones morales, que no es un, que es un tema nuevo, como el, el tema, de ejemplo, de las personas transgénero, el acceso a los servicios en el tema de VIH. Sí ha habido avances, pero también hay retrocesos. Y, y muchas veces esos retrocesos, creo que eh, como sociedad civil, nosotras y nosotros debemos empujar y, y debemos empujar eh, este carro eh, en el sentido de que el acceso universal solo se puede garantizar cuando todos y todas podemos acceder a los servicios sin estigma ni discriminación. Ese es uno de los desafíos. Y creo que otro de los retos es con el tema de la financiación del Fondo Mundial. Generalmente los países solicitan eh, inversión para los recursos humanos en capacitación. Es que también esta capacitación, más allá del tema de VIH, sea también con un abordaje contra el estima la discriminación para mejorar los servicios de salud. Muchas gracias, Silvia. Si me, permit, me permiten, creo que cada uno ha aportado unos, eh, eh, unos ejemplos muy importantes sobre cómo están manejando la estigma y discriminación, cómo deberíamos de, de, de dirigirnos eh, para, para responder a esta situación. Pero quería regresar eh, con una segunda pregunta, si me permiten, a cada una eh, rápidamente. Karen, si te puedo hacer una pregunta de seguimiento. Hablaste sobre barreras en los servicios de salud, eh, falta de datos. Y, y quería preguntarte también si sabemos la importancia eh, de poner la comunidad al centro a la respuesta al VIH, pero también 
eh, son parte clave de combatir el estigma y discriminación. ¿Cómo se han organizado las comunidades en Honduras para abordar este tema? En Honduras, como lo dijo Silvia, también está afectado demasiado por, por el huracaneta. Uh, hubieron más de un millón de afectados y todo el, el contexto que tiene Honduras es totalmente diferente y no va a volver atrás. Eso lo cambió para siempre y aparte con el COVID, eh, siendo un país eh, de bajos recursos, no con, sin tanta educación, mucha gente no se quita del no se eh, cuida del COVID y todo el contexto de Honduras ha cambiado. Eh, ya no hacen tantos eh, grupos focales como antes, algunas casas hogares cerraron y en este contexto de COVID, de huracán, no sabría muy bien cómo responderte a esta pregunta porque todo está tan, este, este año ha sido tan raro que todo, todo ya no es igual. Entonces, entonces se hace como lo que se puede. Eso es. Se hace lo que se puede y la virtualidad no es para todos. Y más en países como Centroamérica. Gracias, Karen. Totalmente de acuerdo que, que realmente América Central realmente ha, se ha sido muy afectado, no solamente por el COVID, pero ahorita con esta situación humanitaria. Eh, María José, eh, otra pregunta para ti, que, que has hablado mucho de la necesidad de integrar la, eh, los temas de sexualidad en, en las escuelas de, en, en la educación y también los materiales y el uso de videos. En el caso... Eh, si tomamos el caso, por ejemplo, de un índice de estigma que se ha, eh, eh, que se ha eh, implementado aquí en Brasil, en el contexto tuyo, eh, y si tomamos, eh, por ejemplo, si los datos de la encuesta de estigma y discriminación en Brasil muestran que la mayoría de las personas sufren algún tipo de violencia y discriminación a su condición serológica y no buscan ayuda por desconocer sus derechos um, y los mecanismos, eh, ¿Cuáles son los principales instrumentos e instituciones en su país a los que pueden recurrir, si esto fuera el caso en, en eh, Uruguay? Bien, en Uruguay el activismo en VIH es bastante reducido. Nos, es como que nos conocemos todos, todas y todas las instituciones. Y si bien somos pocos y pocas, poques, logramos articular la respuesta. Eh, yo trabajo en ACEPO, Asociación de Ayuda del Cero Positivo, que es una asoci asociación que... Hace bastantes años que está, yo ingresé en el 2006, pero hace como 30 años que está, y en la misma, en convenio con el gobierno municipal, tenemos una línea de teléfono gratis este, y confidencial, que es el 0800-3131, asterisco 3131 de Dancel, que es una línea que se llamaba línea SIDA, ahora se llama línea VIH, sexualidad y derechos, que es una línea a la que cualquier persona puede llamar para preguntar cualquier cosa acerca de lo que el nombre de la línea dice, ¿no? Ya sé que al principio solamente se focalizaba sobre el VIH, SIDA, y ahora se amplió y también se responde eso, y se acompaña IBE, y se acompaña todo lo que tiene que ver con otras ITS. Eso es un recurso que cuenta la comunidad, que es utilizado, que estaría bueno que se difundiera más. Eh, ahora le agregamos WhatsApp, le agregamos este, también en una página web. Un lugar donde articulamos lo que tiene que ver con dar respuesta al VIH es también en la conocida, ¿no? Que es donde participamos, como de alguna manera, distintos o distintas, distintos protagonistas, autores, actores, que nos interesa esta temática que acá en este país ha desaparecido prácticamente. Por lo tanto, es, es, somos pocos, estamos organizados, organizadas, se puede recurrir, pero no es un tema que se hable acá. Entonces... ¿Con qué puede contar la comunidad? Con ACEPO, puede contar, hay otra organización que se llama ICW, que todavía está, la red de personas viviendo con VIH SIDA, eso en Montevideo. Después, en lo que es los otros departamentos, hay muy poca organización y otra cosa significativa es que cada organización no tiene más de cuatro personas. Por lo tanto, a nivel de visibilidad, solamente la sociedad civil en este momento está haciendo como un trabajo educativo y para afuera, trabajan consejería, con grupos de autoayuda, articulamos todo lo que tiene que ver con personas privadas de libertad. Ese teléfono está constantemente recibiendo, no encontré la medicación, el médico no me atendió y como estamos y conocemos a, a los doctores, a, a los que están en el ministerio, tenemos esa posibilidad de levantar un teléfono y gestionar este soluciones asertivas para, para cada situación que se encuentra. Indudablemente que 
retomando un poquito lo que plantean todos los compañeros del, plané, del, pan, del panel, la sociedad civil organizada sigue siendo el motor para intentar que esto vuelva a estar en agenda y creo que es el más importante recurso que tiene la comunidad para avanzar en esta temática. Muchas gracias, María José. Eh, brevemente, dos últimas preguntas. Eh, Matías, en el, eh, el estigma y la discriminación contra las personas que viven con el VIH se cruzan con otros tipos de prejuicios. ¿Cuál es el impacto de la cuestión de género en el estigma y los prejuicios en su país? Bien, yo creo que la, la cuestión de género atraviesa eh, al al VIH desde sus inicios, ¿no? Y, y las, las, las dos grandes regiones en donde, donde, está, donde la epidemia tiene mayor fuerza, tanto en, en África como en, en la región de Latinoamérica, tienen su cuestión de género bien afianzada. A nosotros, a nosotros y nosotras nos toca eh, la, los, los fuertes componentes de estima de discriminación hacia personas trans y varones que tenemos sexo con otros varones, pero también eh, con una fuerte incidencia eh, en, en nuevas infecciones de mujeres, sobre todo también mujeres jóvenes y mujeres con, con, eh, mayor, con, con avanzada edad. En ese sentido, creo que, que en los últimos años ha habido una, un, eh, varios avances en, en función de, de políticas contra la violencia de, de género en general eh, y, y en relación a la cuestión eh, trans, ¿no? eh, entendiendo que todavía falta muchísimo, bueno, está... Eh, eh, las redes de personas trans están trabajando muchísimo por el reconocimiento de la identidad y por el reconocimiento de los derechos sociales. En ese sentido, creo que estamos en un, en un momento bisagra en el cual la sociedad empieza a entender que hay determinados grupos vulnerados que sufren aún mayores niveles de violencia que otros eh, y nos parece eh, que en ese sentido tenemos que presionar para eh, poder conseguir estas leyes de inclusión, tanto laboral como de vivienda, como de eh, eh, como sanitaria también y educativa de, de las poblaciones trans para poder también un poco equiparar y llegar a la, a la equidad, a la igualdad que tanto se habla desde hace muchísimo tiempo, pero sin embargo hay determinados colectivos que, que todavía siguen, siguen por detrás. Por eso, en ese sentido, eh, pensar que si bien, como decían las compañeras, la sociedad civil sigue trabajando fuertemente y, y, y creemos que en esta situación, en este año, han sido de los grandes protagonistas, también se entiende que todo el peso viene cargado sobre nuestros hombros eh, y eso genera cansancio eh, y, y de esa manera creo que tenemos que pensar como sociedad civil en, en, en enganchar a los gobiernos, en convencer a los gobiernos de, de poder pensar en políticas eh, contra el estigma y la discriminación. Muchas gracias, Matías. Y si me permiten, la última pregunta aquí para eh, Silvia. En términos de las poblaciones más vulnerables, particularmente um, nuestra población trans, ¿qué podría hacer en su país para reducir estos prejuicios eh, y el estigma que sufre esta, esta población en particular? Eh, yo creo que es muy importante decir, ¿verdad? En este sentido, nosotras hemos apoyado al Ministerio de Salud y como eh, también a la Respuesta Nacional en la Conicida, es decir toda nuestra vulnerabilidad y también ponernos a la orden para los procesos de capacitación con los recursos humanos del Ministerio de Salud. Que me vean a mí tal cual, como soy, eso les ayuda a entender cuáles podrían ser mis necesidades, los mecanismos de atención. Y esto es muy importante. No podemos perder la oportunidad de que nuestras voces se sigan oyendo en estos espacios de toma de decisión. Quiero rescatar, y, y en ese sentido se ha hablado del de proceso de investigación, pero también en la región de nuestros países teníamos con CACIDA, que era el espacio para, para articular investigaciones en SIDA, el Foro Latinoamericano de VIH, que era para toda la región de Latinoamérica, estos dos espacios se han caído y en esos espacios eran un bastión importante para colocar nuestras agendas, nuestras necesidades y un espacio de diálogo. Ahora nos queda solamente la Conferencia Mundial de SIDA y esta generalmente se hace en países donde ponen restricciones. Creo que esto nos debe llamar a la conciencia, que es muy importante, que así como construimos con evidencia, científica, el estigma y la discriminación, 
lo que atañe, lo que daña, lo que ocasiona en el tema de la salud, también debemos de decir con evidencia científica a nuestros tomadores de decisiones, inviertan para que esta situación cambie, inviertan en población LGBT con todas nuestras diferencias, pero inviertan mejorando el acceso, no solamente el acceso a la salud, sino a la educación, al empleo, a la vivienda, a todos los derechos económicos y sociales. Muchas gracias Silvia eh, por ese importante mensaje. Eh, gracias a todos los panelistas. Aquí ahora le entrego la palabra de regreso a Javier, que nos va a entrar a la sesión de preguntas y respuestas. Gracias a todos. Eh, gracias a todos y todas y todos los panelistas y por supuesto a Claudia que ha hecho un excelente trabajo y ha preparado una diversidad de preguntas para que sacar mejor provecho del poco tiempo que teníamos con estos eh, cuatro fantásticos líderes y lideresas. Eh, una pregunta que, que está clarísima y quizás dirigida a Keren o a María José, ¿qué impacto tiene lo que mencionaba Matías hace un rato sobre la noción de que una persona indetectable no puede transmitir el virus, eh, tiene para las mujeres que viven con VIH? Eh, podemos empezar por Keren y después por María José, breve, así podemos compartir una pregunta también con Matías y con Silvia. Disculpen que es una pregunta sí, profunda, pero breve. ¿Quieren? Voy a, voy a hacer lo más breve posible porque eh, cuando eh, pienso en I igual a I, se me viene en Honduras totalmente, es diferente el tema en Argentina y, claro. y en Honduras el I, el I igual a I todavía no se llega. Y tengo un poco de temor, esto ya es personal, tengo un poco de temor de que mucha gente, como las mujeres con VIH, tomen el I igual ahí como que no, ya el VIH no, no, no se pasa, eso ya no, no, ¿para qué? ¿para qué usar condón? Entonces primero, para mí, tenemos que seguir con la, la información en países centroamericanos, empezar desde cero otra vez con la información, con el VIH, el, eh, lo base para poder hablar de igual ahí. Y en términos de mujeres con VIH es un gran avance, porque podemos tener, podemos estar embarazadas, podemos tener parto más natural, podemos tener hijos sin riesgo a, al VIH, eso, eso es en términos de mujeres y en Honduras. Muy bien, y creo que está señalando que no es una fórmula mágica, que hay que asegurar el acceso continuado e ininterrumpido al tratamiento, a las pruebas de carga viral, es, y que América Latina son muchos países en una misma región y donde la inequidad es un tema. María José, la misma pregunta. Bien, eh, en primer lugar, obviamente que es muy importante la intersección ¿no? de... de del nivel educativo y de los recursos económicos para hablar de, de indetectables igual intransmisibles. No, no solamente eh, eh, que lo sepamos, sino que, que, que en la vida cotidiana se pueda llevar adelante. En lo que refiere para mí, este, en relación al género y en relación a ser mujer, ya de por sí se nos ha negado de, de arranque históricamente la sexualidad, el placer, el goce, nombrar nuestra genitalidad, eh, ser libres, poder disfrutar, y eso ya históricamente a la, la mujer que de alguna manera vivía eso ya ha sido catalogada como puta, como loca, como desviada, ¿no? De alguna manera el VIH viene a reconfirmar el discurso, los discursos que hay alrededor de, del VIH vienen a reconfirmar un poco en el imaginario, ¿no? En la construcción del imaginario, eso, ¿no? Como que devolución de del diagnóstico de alguna manera... Este, te reconfirma eh, esa idea loca. ¿no? Eh, el vivir nuestra sexualidad plena, que es un derecho sexual, reproductivo, por lo tanto humano, se ve restringido muchas veces por la idea que nos hacemos de nosotras mismas por tener un diagnóstico positivo. Eso influencia en la, en la vivencia de la sexualidad. Porque, no sé si decirlo, lo digo y capaz que no. Entonces, el hecho de tener el dato de que tenés la tranquilidad de que pese que igual use las barreras de protección, ¿no? que a veces igual usando una tiene como la fantasía porque se siente como una bomba eh, contaminante, porque es lo que nos han enseñado, creo que nos libera muchísimo nuevamente, el feminismo nos viene liberando históricamente de lo que tiene que ver con no gozar eh, eh, nuestra sexualidad, y pienso que esta información de alguna manera nos vuelve a liberar de esa cárcel en que el diagnóstico nos podría llegar a poner o nos pone a muchas mujeres este, a vivir nuestra sexualidad plenamente. 
Muchísimas gracias. Matías, vos que trabajaste en una asociación que se ha embanderado muchísimo con el tema de igual ahí, ¿qué, qué, qué efectos eh, beneficiosos, aparte de los que mencionaba María José y Keren, en, los, en un contexto de buen acceso, tiene eh, esta buena noticia que hay que comunicar eh, a los cuatro vientos? Yo creo que, que el efecto más inmediato... Eh, me parece que, que, la, que la población esté informada siempre es positivo, ¿no? Porque la información es la herramienta que nos permite tomar las decisiones con libertad. Si yo estoy informado, si yo sé de algo, tengo una mejor, estoy parado en un mejor lugar para tomar alguna decisión de lo que sea. Específicamente eh, con, con respecto de igual ahí, tiene que ver con las relaciones sexuales, con el disfrute, con pensar cómo relacionarme con un otro. Pero me parece que el, uno de los efectos que vemos, además de tener mayor y mejor información, es el de reducir el rechazo, ¿no? Y lo pienso porque lo pienso desde el punto de vista eh, de igual ahí en relación a la transmisión sexual, eh, específicamente como, como dice el postulado del Partner 2. Y me parece que eso se ve, se ve menos rechazo, ¿no? En, en lo, lo vamos viendo en los diferentes grupos de, de, de personas con VIH que todavía seguimos manteniendo. La información va llegando, de a poco va llegando y... Y, y eso se ve menos rechazo de, de, de relaciones sexoafectivas. Y no, no solamente lo digo como varón que tiene sexo con otros varones, sino también en relaciones heterosexuales, en otros en otro tipo de relaciones también. Me parece que, que, que parte de, de, lo, de, de, lo, de lo, una de, las, de, las, de los resultados es en el, en el menor rechazo, la menor discriminación en, en relación a, a poder conseguir una pareja sexual, una pareja eh, amorosa, y eso, y eso lo vemos. Creo que eso es una victoria del activismo, porque, bueno. porque realmente esto es, es una puja del activismo. Ahora de a poquito se va sumando el, los, la, los, los equipos de salud eh, a difundir el mensaje también, pero bueno, será también tarea nuestra hacer que la información llegue a más personas. Exacto, y, y, y so, también poner el énfasis, como bien decías, el estudio Parnar 2 habla sobre relaciones sexuales, hay sobradas evidencias que el, la misma ecuación de I igual I funciona para la gestación, para el parto, para el amamantamiento, o sea, cambia totalmente el paradigma de casi, te diría, la violencia institucional que se ejercía sobre las mujeres y, y sus parejas viviendo con VIH en, en el sistema de salud, ¿no? Uno de los lugares donde la mayoría de las poblaciones claves se han identificado donde sucede más el estigma y la discriminación. Y también un poco ustedes han estado hablando de algo que por ahí no se mencionó por el nombre, pero es el autoestigma, ¿no? Eh, un poco lo decía María José, un poco lo dijiste vos, Matías, un poco Keren. Pero nos queda muy poco tiempo y quería hablar con Silvia un poquito eh, la bajada a realidad, a, a una realidad que no nos tiene que, que pinchar las buenas noticias, pero es la realidad de vivir en un contexto de emergencia. Entonces quería la última reflexión de Silvia por cómo ha pasado en Venezuela, cómo ha pasado en Centroamérica, antes y durante y después de, de la tragedia climática y, y con el coronavirus en muchas partes de la región. Eh, ¿Qué es lo que pasa? ¿Cómo, has, ¿Cómo hace una persona trans para acceder a un servicio de salud cuando las, durante una cuarentena, durante un, un, una respuesta de emergencia humanitaria, militarizada, etcétera? Silvia, algo que nos puedas compartir, eh, porque también lo vemos con el COVID. Sí, en este sentido creo, Javier, que es importante colocar dos cosas. Una persona trans en una situación de emergencia no existe, no cuenta, ni siquiera uh -huh. tiene servicios. Eso es muy importante decirlo. Generalmente las líneas prioritarias son todo el mundo menos las poblaciones en mayor riesgo. Dos, Además de que los países enfrentan diferentes situaciones, tenemos, ejemplo, el tema de eh, estos dos huracanes que acaban de pasar, eh, han dejado eh, parado cierto transporte de, eh, de medicamentos que vienen a eh, ser entregados en, y dispensariados en los diferentes puestos médicos, etc. También, el tema del de burning up, el quemado, como lo han dicho de alguna manera. Los recursos humanos están pasando crisis con el COVID. Ahora además le agregas el tema de los, estas emergencias o las cuarentenas. Eh, hubo un momento, en Nicaragua no hubo cuarentena, pero sí mirábamos, por ejemplo, que en otros países la crisis emocional que se vivía, pero también el no vivir en una cuarentena 
eh, puede haber sido un reservorio para el COVID-19 y ahora esto nos coloca en mayor riesgo por el tema de esta emergencia climática. Eh, creo que es muy importante hacer esta reflexión, ¿verdad? Sobre todo porque sí. en la mayor cantidad de prestación de servicios público o privado, las personas de la diversidad y sobre todo las personas trans ni siquiera existimos como prioridad. Entonces, desde ahí se cae el, el nicho o el mensaje de que el acceso universal para la salud es realidad. Entonces, ahí yo creo que es importante decir que es una materia pendiente y sobre todo cuando en los países sucede una o X situación que cambia el entorno y de alguna manera esto nos coloca que Totalmente. al pasar en, en un estado de vigilancia o de supresión de policía, ni derechos, no son derechos, pasan a ser cualquier otra cosa menos derechos humanos. Muchísimas gracias Silvia, bueno, nos hemos quedado sin tiempo y lo que dice Silvia aplica para toda la región y para todo el mundo con el COVID. Gracias Matías eh, Muñoz, gracias Silvia Martínez, gracias María José Hernández, gracias Karen Danaguay y por supuesto a mi co -keeper, Claudia Velázquez eh, por esta mesa sobre estigma y discriminación donde hemos tocado otros tantos temas importantes. Le paso entonces la la antorcha al presidente de la Sociedad Argentina de Infectología, casi digo de SIDA, el doctor Omar Suel. Muchas gracias. Perdón. Gracias, muchísimas gracias a todos. Parece que no estaba hablando, parece que estaba sin micrófono. Para sí mí ha sido un placer verlos, escucharlos. Eh, a Matías, un amigo, a Keren, que no la conocía de antes y ha sido un placer. Eh, a la compañera de, de Uruguay también. Y Silvia, es un, un gusto escuchar tu, tu relato tan concreto, tan eh, así, real, digamos. ¿no? Y entonces es buenísimo felicitarlos a ustedes por este activismo y tratar de invitarlos a que seamos clientes frecuentes de estos espacios de, en, con la Sociedad Argentina de Infectología, que desde ya eh, tiene las puertas abiertas para estas interacciones, con Javier, que también es un amigo de la casa, con el apoyo de la, de la IAS, porque, digamos, eh, eh, es parte de la responsabilidad de, de la IAS. Entonces, eh, doy paso ya a la reunión de cierre. Primero que nada, agradecer a todos ustedes. El, el segundo... Eh, tema es que quiero darles, a ver que pase esta diapositiva, exacto, acá, quiero dar las gracias a todos los participantes, esperemos que haya sido eh, interesante, queremos agradecer a Merck, a Yardom, a Viv, a la Agencia Suiza para el Desarrollo de la Cooperación, eh, queremos eh, invitarlos a todos los que están escuchando que se hagan socios de la Sociedad Internacional de SIDA, obviamente que de la SADI también, hay una oferta que está en pantalla para todos los miembros jóvenes y estudiantes para tener una suscripción en la IAS de seis meses gratuita. Eh, y el objetivo de esta reunión, bueno, era reducir esta brecha justamente que existe entre el nivel de conocimiento que tenemos y el impacto de salud pública por la falta de implementación de algunas de estas medidas que ya sabemos que son de eficacia comprobada, como ustedes bien mencionaban, el solo hecho de poder decirle claramente a la gente Estás en tratamiento, estás indetectable, no transmitís, quédate tranquilo. Eh, tiene un impacto inmenso en la vida de las personas y los médicos tienen que aprender a, a decirlo así de claro. Esperamos que les haya sido de utilidad, esperamos que no sea la última. Eh, les pedimos que recuerden que van a recibir una encuesta por mail. Por favor, complétenla porque es la única forma de saber si las cosas que estamos haciendo las hacemos bien. Gracias a todos, cuídense y esperemos que no sea la última vez que estemos compartiendo una pantalla y que en muy poco tiempo podamos compartir una mesa eh, más cerca. Muchísimas gracias a todos, un placer. Dejamos entonces la mesa para el, el doctor Cohen, que se va a unir en, este, en, este, en pocos minutos. Muchísimas gracias, completen la encuesta. Adiós.